All right, if you have your Bible this morning, <clears throat> turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, in the other hand. So in one hand, Galatians 2, 20. The other hand, Hebrews 10, 38. What I'm going to preach about this morning is the things that eat away at faith. Now, once you get saved... You're saved. Amen. You're going to glory. You got a home in heaven and no body on you. But then you got this, this new life. What's it all about? And I was saved at 16 and I uh, hadn't been in, probably hadn't been in church five times in my life when I was 16 years old. And it was a complete new life to me. And it's challenging. Um, Hopefully this will be a help to you. I think it will be an encouragement to you, even though there's a lot of negative things about the message. Hopefully it will be an encouragement to you. Uh, I'll tell you what folks can't deal with. They just can't deal with their feelings. If they get past their feelings, they'll be fine. But it's, it's, I feel, I feel, I feel. And then because they feel, they react, and they react badly. If you can just put that away for a little bit, we'll see it here. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So not only were you saved by grace through faith, but you live by faith, and you definitely live by the grace of God. So you're saved for all eternity, but yet you have this life in front of you, and it has to be a life that is lived by faith. He said in Hebrews 10, 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And that is, when it comes to walking this Christian walk, unless you walk it by faith, God's not going to have any pleasure in it. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So when you draw back, He doesn't have any pleasure in you. Why do you exist? For God's pleasure. Revelation chapter 4, 1, 1. All right, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. Thank you for those here. Thank you for our visitors. Pray, that you be a, pray this be a blessing and maybe a help to them. Lord, you know what's going on today. So many folks are out sick. Uh, one trying to... Uh, Move some things, Lord, that need to be moved, and you know who that is, and I just pray you'd help them. I pray that you'd strengthen them. I pray that you'd be with those that are sick and heal them up. I pray for those that are suffering, that you'd ease their pain. I pray for those that are dying, Lord, that they receive the grace from on high, Father. And Lord, did you receive them soon into your kingdom, Father. And we'll thank you for that, and pray that you'd bless now as we preach the Word of God. We ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Luke chapter 18, verse 8, just one little section of this verse. It says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I mean, we're supposed to live by faith. Will he find any faith when he comes? You know, he's going to come for the church. We talked about that in Sunday school. He's going to rapture us out of here. Is he going to find any faith? I mean, they've already butchered the Bible. You, you, go, you go into a, a Christian bookstore, and there'll be 50 different versions of the Bible. All of them corrupt except one. You go to 50 different churches, and all of them will be preaching something about the Bible, but 49 of them will be wrong. Because they don't believe the book, they don't preach the book. And, well, when he comes back, will he find faith? Well, I want to talk about what eats away at faith. And, um, I don't know, maybe you said this, you know, like, something like, Boy, Lord, I was just getting ready to go all out for you until this happened. Well, you know, whatever it takes to stop you, that is the measure of faith you possessed. You do know that, right? Whatever it takes to stop you, that is the measure of faith that you possess. And I know why God causes everything to go haywire. I know why. Because it's the only way that He can test your faith. For a Christian, probably every day there's a test or two. Just to see what you'll do. And he'll test you, he'll test you, especially with feelings and things like that. I mean, I didn't feel good this morning when I got up. I didn't feel good. I got a backache right now. So what? Okay, got a backache. Don't feel good. Uh, 
It's not enough to stop me physically from doing what God called me to do. Do I feel like I could, I could do the best preaching this morning? No, but rarely do I ever feel like I could do the best preaching. All I know is this, that God's not out to destroy your faith. And some Christians get it in their mind, God's after them, and He's not. But maybe show you that you have none. Because He said, When the Son of Man cometh, shall He find faith on the earth. When He comes back for the church, I kind of wonder how much faith He's going to find. Oh, we say we believe it, we read it and all that, but we, do we really, really believe it and really trust Him with it? That's the question. But I'm going to talk about some things that, the things that eat away at faith. The things that really put your faith, I can stand anything for about five minutes. Well, maybe not that long. 60 seconds, I can stand just, well, maybe not 60 seconds. All depends what it is. But you'll notice that the longer the thing lasts, the more it eats away at your faith. All of a sudden, what God said is not as real to you as you thought it was. The promises don't seem to be as, oh, I don't know, as good as you thought they were. That's all because time has kind of eroded away at that faith. So time can eat away at faith. Uh, there was, in Luke chapter 8, turn there, Luke chapter 8, verse 43 and 44. Jesus Christ comes, upon, comes across a woman who's been sick. It says in verse, Luke chapter 8, verse 43 and 44, and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years. Don't you know it's a long time to have something afflicting you? 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians. Neither could be healed of any. So they took her money and didn't heal her, didn't even help her. It says, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. In other words, whatever problem it was, it went away immediately. Okay? But you imagine how long she had to put up with that thing? I mean, you get to questioning whether there is a God. You get to feeling so bad about something and so, something just weighing in on you that your mind just goes crazy with these things. Because the time, it's, it's that issue of time that is eating at you. And God just wants to show you, still believe me? See, it's not a matter of what you feel. It's a matter of what you believe. Do you still believe me? Now, you might not, you're not going to go, you know, you may not have a smile on your face. But you can say, yeah, Lord, I still believe you. I'm hurting, but I still believe you. That pleases him. Look in um, 2 Peter chapter 3. Sometimes it's when you think something should have happened by now. In 2 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, we've already got them, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? I mean, that's happening now in the church. They're questioning whether He's really coming back or not. Oh, my grandmother used to tell us that. And they're going on and on about it. Let me tell you something. Time's not up yet. Time's not up yet. That generation that saw Israel become a nation, time is not up yet. So don't lose your faith. Don't give it up when it comes to believing the promise of His coming. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They said nothing's changed. It's all the same. Where is the promise of His coming? You know why? Time eroded their faith. We know that in the last days, the church will apostatize. It'll become full of false doctrine. And you know what they don't? They don't believe the promises of Scripture anymore. Jesus said, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Do you believe it or not? If you do, then hold on. It's not over yet. <laughs> There's still time. And you know, we always say, he always he call, he comes in the nick of time. <laughs> He'll come, he'll come when He's ready to come. But, I mean, He will be here. You can trust that. You can believe that. He's never failed anything else, has He? You know, of all the prophecies in this book that talked about His first coming, 48 in total, not one of them failed. Not one. They came to pass 100% accurate. 48 out of 48. 
I think the odds of that happening, if you were to go to Vegas, is 1 times 10 to the 157th power. That's 10 with 157 zeros behind it. Would you bet against that number? It's a fool's bet. You can't, in fact, there's, you can't even imagine that number. It's astronomical because we're talking some of those were a thousand years before he showed up. 48 out of 48. There are 500 about his second coming. 500. You have, you have me able to come to pass? All of them! Because God wrote the book. So don't let time eat away at faith. I know you're dealing with things. We're all dealing with things, and we'll continue to deal with things. We'll deal with sickness. We'll deal with uh, circumstances. And the longer they, they keep gnawing at you, I mean, just realize the promises of God are still as good as when He spoke them. You know, I think the thing that Christians don't understand is that God does not... When, when you get saved, you have no idea the position you've been put in. You've been put in a position that God loves you. He doesn't necessarily love the lost. He, he extends His love toward them, but unless, if, except, unless they accept Christ, they don't get His love. You are in the love of God. He can do nothing but love you. And even though He's allowing things to happen for purposes to help you with your faith doesn't mean that he's, you know, he's up there just, you know, I'm going to get you. He's not, it's not like that for a Christian. It might be like that for somebody else, but not you. You're in the love of God. That can never change because you're God, one of God's children. You received a new birth. You're, can you change your first birth? You're born to who you're born to, right? You can't change your second birth either. And you couldn't even if you wanted to. But time can eat away at faith. Circumstances can eat away at faith. Remember we're studying the book of Job? <laughs> Poor Job. It says, in, uh, I'll just read this one little passage. It says, while he was yet speaking, there came another. And you know that that one day there, he had like four or five of them come up to him and said, Up, oh, you know, uh, all your cattle's gone. All your sheep are gone. All your camels are gone. Uh, by the way, your ten children, they're dead. And all your servants have been killed by the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wow. Circumstances. Now, probably no one will ever go through the extreme thing that Job went through. We know what that pictures uh, in the future, but we probably none of us will ever experience it on that. But it doesn't mean we can't have circumstances. It doesn't mean in one day we couldn't get bad news from one or two sources. It's possible. And I'm saying that all God wants to know is, is, do you believe me? I mean, as long as everything's good, guys, and you got, you know, all the food you need and all the money you need, and you, you got uh, a house to live in, and everything's going great, where's the exercising of faith in that? So God allows circumstances. Peculiar, sometimes peculiar. Those are the ones that kind of throw me, the, the ones that are kind of weird that God allows. I'm, I'm trying, and I can't figure it out. Well, He doesn't want me to figure it out. He just still wants me to trust Him with it. But the peculiar, extreme, or numerous circumstances uh, can test your faith. And they'll happen. Not, not only can time and circumstances eat away at faith, but interpretations can too. Just reading it wrong can get you in a world of hurt and a, and a real mess. The reason you read it wrong is because you don't study it to rightly divide it, which the Bible says you must do. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are divisions to be made. When those divisions aren't made, well, that's how we got all these denominations. And that's how we got all these different doctrines. And that's how we got all these different heresies and cults and not properly dividing the word of truth. If it were not possible, God wouldn't tell you to do it. You say, well, they're probably all right. No, they're not. Somebody's wrong. Now, you come to this church and you listen to this preacher. I'm either right or I'm wrong. But you ought to be able to tell from the book. That's why God gave it to you. I'm not the final authority. The Bible is. You're to check me. Don't believe me. Check me out. Look at the verses. Look at the context around the verses. Compare the verses with other verses and see if I am telling you the truth. 
I checked out everybody I ever studied, including Dr. Ruckman. Every verse, I checked it out. Why? Because I'm to trust this, not them. I can make a mistake. I can lie to you and never intend to. The only way you'd know is if you check it yourself. Study it out for yourself. Look at it yourself. But interpretations can eat away at faith. Let me give you read these to you. You don't have to turn to these. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and, thou, uh, and be thou cast into the sea, and shalt not doubt in his heart, he shall believe that these things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. He's talking about a mountain disappearing. <laughs> well, you know, either it's hyperbole, which is, now, the, the, you know, the Lord did use hyperbole. You did know that. That's where uh, exaggeration. He said, uh, he said about the Pharisees, they strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That's hyperbole. That is exaggeration. It's showing the extreme that, you know, they get this little thing caught in their throat, you know, that they, that they, uh, they don't believe or they have a problem with, and they strain it. You ever, you ever swallowed a gnat? <laughs> but then they take down the whole camel in one gulp. That's the difference. In other words, the, the very smallest of thing you, you sit there and choke and spit and spatter about, but then this huge thing that you shouldn't have got wrong, you swallow it whole. They strain it in that and swallow a camel. Well, this is the thing, if it's hyperbole, he's just talking about, listen, prayer can change great things. But in the tribulation, there's going to be some folks that could literally remove mountains. There's going to be some earthquakes. There's going to be some things that happen that are literally going to level. Islands will disappear. Mountain ranges will disappear. So it's possible. It's just where do you apply the thing? Well, if you apply it in this age, God can do great things if you'll pray. I promise you that. In Mark 16, verse 17 and 18, this is a popular passage with uh, charismatics. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, the Bible says over in Revelation chapter 1, them that say they are apostles or not, it says to try them to say that... Try them which say they are apostles and are not, and thou hast found them liars. You can try out someone to see if they're an apostle because they have to have the signs and wonders of an apostle. And one of the things is they can drink any deadly thing. Now, I used to use this method until I realized I could be charged with, uh, you know, negligent homicide. <laughs> so, and I can't give them a snake, you know. But one thing you'll never hear about them doing at these uh, healing tents is you'll never see any of them raising the dead. Ain't seen that happen yet. I remember, um, this is back in the, the 60s, I, I don't remember, read about it, where, um, who's the one guy? Um, no, uh, before Benny. R R R Earl Robert? Earl Roberts. He's the one that saw the 900 foot or 90 foot G's or something like that in his bed or something. I shoot anything at my bed, it's over you know, six feet tall. I, um, Anyway, he saw this 900-foot, 90-foot Jesus. Anyway, he had this, this tent meeting. And, um, I mean, they had literal uh, tents erected. These are tents that are like um, uh, circus tents, how big they are. And they have these healing meetings. Well, this wind blew up. I think this might have been in Alabama. But this wind blew up. Might even been a tornado. I don't know. But it came through there and just literally just wrecked, went right through them tents, snapped them mast. Then things fell on people. People injured everywhere. So what do you think he did? He called the ambulances. You know, if I had the power to heal with my touch, now I, I believe in praying for it, I believe God can heal. But if I had the power of healing my touch, you know, Dr. Ruckman used to say this, where's the first place you'd go? Well, you'd go to Children's Medical Center, wouldn't you? You'd go to the cancer ward? Or go to them kids that are going about to perish? I mean, if there's anybody that you want to heal, it would be the children, wouldn't you? Well, why don't they go there? Why, why, have a, why take up six offerings during a, a meeting? Freely you've received, freely give, the Bible says. Why you got to charge for it? Or why you got to be so specific on who you ask? They walk in the back in a, uh, with a walker, they put them in a wheelchair. They come in in a wheelchair, you know, and they'll do something else with it. Can you stand? And then, they're, you know, when Jesus Christ healed, he never failed. He didn't have any 
uh, short fuses or, uh, you know, uh, it didn't sputter out. I mean, when he healed somebody, he healed them. You know, they don't come in walking like this when they come in and then walk out like that and think they're healed. Jesus Christ healed someone. He healed them. And that's what you don't see today. You get that interpretation wrong. You don't realize it's for the last days, signs and wonders that deal with Israel, which uh, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Jews seeketh a sign. So Jesus Christ came with signs and wonders. The apostles to Israel came with signs and wonders. And in the tribulation, we'll see signs and wonders again, but not in the church age. Why? We have a completed revelation of everything you need to know about God. Now, can God heal? Of course, we pray for healing all the time. Sometimes He does, sometimes He doesn't. But we still pray for it. So interpretations can eat away at faith. You get something read wrong, and then all of a sudden it doesn't go the way you thought, or it's kind of weird, whatever, and then you, you, it, it affects your faith. Natural law can eat away at faith. Uh, in Matthew 5.45, he says, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Is that some things that happen to some people happen to everybody else too. I mean, if there's a hailstorm, God doesn't put a um, force field around your car. Or your head, for that matter. You ought to have enough sense to get out of a hailstorm. We had one down there in uh, Xenia when they had the church down there. And it's a metal building. And I thought it was coming loose. We went, to, you know, I'm, I don't tip God. I don't get out there and say, well, Lord, I trust you not to hit me. He'll probably brain me upside the head, you know, and be laying there blood all everywhere. We got in between uh, the, the, the Sunday school rooms and the auditorium. We got into this one area. I figured the strongest area. Because it was metal, it, the, 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 that thing was so loud, I can't even, I can't even describe the sound. It's just you had to go like this, you know. And, and I had all the kids down and everything, you know. And it was, uh, it, it ruined our cars out there. It broke my windshield. It dented the cars out there in the parking lot. When that thing got done, we walked outside and it literally shredded these trees. And there was a, like a two-inch carpet of leaves, shredded leaves all over the, uh, all over the road. I mean, this was a, a tremendous hailstorm and wind. But it, it got my vehicle. Luckily, I was driving an old, uh, an old van. It wasn't worth anything, so I really didn't. But the rest of the folks were, weren't driving something old and, and junky. And it, it, really, it really messed their car up. It, it fell on the just and on the unjust. Some things just happen. Sometimes you get a flat tire. And, you know, I think that there's, there's nothing by accident. Don't get me wrong here. There's nothing by accident for a Christian. Okay? The reason you don't play a game of chance, not a game of skill, but a game of chance. The reason you don't play a game of chance is there's no such thing as chance in your life anymore. God is in the intricate details of your life. But God's just not going to protect you from natural things that happen. If you go out in the sun and don't wear a hat, guess what will happen? You'll get a sunburn, especially if you've got a top that's open like mine. Okay? If you, if, you, uh, if you don't take certain precautions, I mean, you'll pay the price for it. And sometimes we think that those natural things, it's like gravity is a natural law. We're all subject to it, saved or lost. Um. You know, if you drive on bold tires, don't be surprised uh, if you spin out on a wet road. It's not God doing it to you. It's kind of like your own stupidity. Um, so the natural things that befall us, befall the lost, befall us also. Uh, there was a... Now, here's the thing, though. There was, a, there was a tornado. I believe it was in Alabama, I think, or Georgia. I can't remember which. And they were interviewing this guy because I'm watching it, and, you know, and he was, a, uh, he was like the church janitor. And when this thing blew through, there's nobody in church but him. And uh, he went outside, he ran out there, and he looked, and it was coming right at him. So he, he ran back in the church. And, you know, a lot of churches have a table up front where they have the memorial, where they, the church, uh, the Lord's Supper. And it's usually a pretty thick, uh, if, if, if it's a real one, it's oak. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just a solid oak table, but it's usually pretty brawny. He dives under that thing, begins to pray. I mean, he's a saved man. When the storm's over, that church is completely gone. 
except for that table and that man under that table. And they interviewed him, and I listened to, his inter to, uh, to him being interviewed. And man, he gave, he gave all the glory to God. And there's where the church took the hit, a building, but not the, brother, not the, not the, not the, uh, the saint. He survived it under that table. So even though there are natural things that happen, it's not that God can't intervene. He can. And when you need Him to, pray and have Him intervene. But He's not going to stop the raindrops from landing on your head if you're out in the rain. Um, but sometimes we allow those things to affect our faith. There's a wickedness of others can eat away at faith. Uh, let me read this passage. This is in Psalm 71, verse 1 to 12. It says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape, incline thine ear unto me, and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continue to resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I holden up from the womb. Thou art he that... Uh, he that took me out of my mother's bowels, my praise shall be continually of thee. I am as a, a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with all thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth, for mine enemies speak against me. And they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. And sometimes when you see the wickedness that's around you, if you ever notice something, and I mean this is rare, <clears throat> usually when a Christian is doing right, he's supposed to be where he's supposed to be, he's doing what, he's supposed, what God wants him to do, God will protect that man and evil won't be able to touch him. It might be all around him, but it won't touch him. I've seen that so many times. God can protect you in the midst of evil. But sometimes we see evil. Man, it, listen, the Jews saw such evil during the time of Nazi Germany that uh, a good portion of them are now atheists. They couldn't believe there's a God that would allow that thing to exist. That allow that type of uh, inhumanity or cruel, cruelty to exist. They just can't believe there's a God that allow that. I'm here to tell you there is. And you better fear him. But one thing's for sure about that is sometimes wickedness, uh, the wickedness of others can eat away at your faith. And you just need to trust the Lord through that too. Again, it's a trial. Um, good example that David had his kingdom ripped away by his son, uh, by his own son, Absalom. <laughs> now you end up getting it back. But sometimes things happen, man. People turn against you. You have things happen. You have things happen in the ministry all the time. I, the, the greatest thing I ever learned being on the mission field and pastoring a church and doing whatever is never overreact. And, I, and listen, I'm bent to overreact. Okay? That's how I flow. Oh, I overreact. And the Lord said, quit overreacting. Give me a moment, will you? Sit still for a moment, will you? Just let me work for a moment without you overreacting. That's what he tells me. I don't know what he tells you. That's how he tells me. Just shut up for a second. Just wait for a second. Just let it pass for a little bit and see what I'll do. Every time I've let him have it, he's worked it out. Every time. Now, if it's something I can do, I do it. But if it's something I can't do, instead of just, you know, <laughs> doing this, you know, it's just trust him just a little. He is God. I think he can handle it, whatever the situation is. You say, what is that? That's faith. What do you think it was? It's faith. I said, okay, Lord. I mean, it's obvious you can do something about it. It's obvious you can change it. And if he doesn't change it, guess what? That's the way he wants it. Now you have to live with it the way he wants it. But at least you know. Listen, if it's the will of God, okay. If God's good for it, why wouldn't I be good for it? It's when I panic, you know, that everything's out of control. Nothing's ever out of God's control. It looks like it is. In fact, it looks the same 
to the saved person as it is to the lost world. It looks the same, the identical situations. You're like, whoa, but yet God's got you. You're his child. He knows the very hairs of your head are numbered. He knows everything that befalls you that day. He takes personal interest in you. Not the church, you. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. But you're the apple of his eye. You're his kid. So nothing, and I mean nothing, happens to you that God does not measure that thing. He talks about chastising his children, chasing them, spanking them. Whenever he does it, he likens it unto silver that's being uh, where, where you, uh, you cook silver, you heat it to a certain temperature so that you can get the dross off the top. But you have to measure how much heat or you can ruin the silver. And he likens you to choice silver. And when he's, he'll turn up that heat, but he's got how long and how much heat there is. Everything in your life is measured. How long you go through something, God has that. How hot it gets, God has that temperature control too. He's not, he says, He'll not tempt you above that which you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's what it says, right? <coughs> Sometimes the wickedness of suffering, this is the, oh, suffering's got to be the, the biggest one. And different kinds of suffering, but pain of all sorts. Jeremiah 15, 15 to 18. O Lord, thou knowest, this is Jeremiah. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy uh, long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. The words were found, and I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Why? Look, he's asking this question. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? What a question to ask the Lord. Are you going to be a liar to me? If you'll trust Him, you'll never say those words. It's only when you begin to doubt Him that you're going to say those words. God will come through. However, in life or death, listen, we got it made no matter how it goes. If we live, we got the Lord. If we die, we got the Lord. <laughs> Paul said, whether we live there, therefore, or die, therefore, you know, we live for the Lord. We live for His glory. And if you'll trust Him with it, He'll get you through the thing. But He's just wanting to know. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So what's God going to do every day of your life? He's going to test your faith. And the only way He can test your faith is to bring, is to bring things into it that challenge it. It's one thing, me, I could preach this thing up and get you all excited to everything. I mean, I could probably flower it up, you know, and uh, offer a $100 bill under somebody's chair or something like that, you know, really. I could really just, we could probably fill this church, you know, if we give out groceries at the door and stuff like that. Just really beef it up, you know, really get you going. But then when you walk outside that door, something happens. It's called reality. This is for reality. Not besides reality. You don't come here to get this. You take this with you out there. Because there's, if anybody has a handle on reality, it's the Lord. If anyone can tell you about the sufferings and the pressures and the, the uh, circumstances of life, it's the Lord and this book. <clears throat> Suffering, whether men or physical, can, can wear on faith. So, how do we add faith? Real quickly. The one way to increase your faith is by reading the Word of God. You can increase your faith by increasing your knowledge of God's Word. And it says that. Romans 10, 17 says, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When you begin to study this book, it begins to open up to you, and you begin to see every possible scenario of life. I mean, it's just unfolding before your eyes. And God applying that thing, it increases your faith. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that faith doesn't get challenged. It does all the time. But the only reason it gets challenged is because you allow your feelings to override your faith. You know that and I know that. 
Listen, somebody cuts you off in traffic, first thing you do, man, is that old man, <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're ready to kill, you know. Maybe you just need to calm down. I remember one time, I, uh, my wife and I, we were sitting at, uh, sitting at a traffic light, and it was bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, you know, and hot out, and I don't think we had any air conditioning, and we were just kind of sitting there, and all of a sudden, boom. Wasn't very hard, you know, and I could have just jumped out and said, what in the world are you doing? Can't you drive? It was some old lady. And she goes, I'm so sorry. She probably thought I was going to beat her up or something. I said, ma'am, that's perfectly okay. There's no damage to my car. Are you okay? Gave her a gospel tract, invited her to church. And then I wondered, I thought, hmm. You know, God could have allowed that to happen just so I take that gospel tract and go back there. Because what I saw it was, I jumped out to see if she was okay. And give her that gospel tract, invite her to church. Maybe that's all God wanted me to do. So he allowed her to bump my car. If she'd have bashed in a light or uh, tore up the, uh, the bumper, if she'd have got saved, it'd been worth it. Sometimes God's just doing things because He needs you to be able to give your faith to others and show your faith to others. But if you don't believe He's in control of things, you might go off, you might go off, uh, if, you know, I think, I, wasn't a, I don't think we were in an old junker at the time. Of course, that's about all I own is junkers. Um, but even if it had been a new car, even if it had been a new car, God would have expected me to behave exactly that way. My faith tells me that. This book tells me that. Either he's in control of my life or he's not. And if he's not, wow, things are out of control. But if he is, then why wouldn't I react that way? If God allowed it, must be so. Must be a purpose, must be a reason. A little faith goes a long way, so use what you have. A lot of folks just don't use what they have. He said in uh, Luke 17, 6, the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, now here's one of those hyperboles again, uh, you, you, might, you might say to this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. And who's to say in the tribulation something like that can happen? But point being is that use the faith you got. You'd be amazed. We've been a praying church. How many prayers have we seen answered? Thousands. And some of them, big prayers. But a lot... A lot of prayers that, you know, we pray and, we, and the Lord answers it. He'll do that the rest of your life. Just use the faith you got. If you've got faith to believe it, then claim it. Lastly, whatever, whatever befalls us most of the time is to exercise our faith to increase our faith. You're never going to build any faith in God if God never challenges it and tests it. So He does it continually. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 34 to 37, and this is David talking to King Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Saul's kind of probably snickering under his breath. David's like, you know, he's just a youth. He's just a young boy. Maybe 18, maybe 17, 18 years old. And this Goliath is 13 feet tall. He's got a sword so heavy, David can barely lift the thing. Um, and David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. <laughs> Last rites on him. Think about it a second. David is claiming that God will give him the victory over this Philistine that is humongous, that all the rest of Israel is scared to death to even challenge. The, 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 listen, the tallest one in Israel was Saul, the king. He was head and shoulders higher than anyone in Israel. That's what the Bible says. And he was scared to death. He was over seven feet tall, or seven feet tall, about that. He is scared to death to go out there. He was not going to go out there and fight that giant. But notice why David thought he could take the giant. Because here's this shepherd boy that had fought a lion and a bear. 
Now, I'm sure when he fought the lion, he probably was scared half to death, but God gave him the victory over the lion. He killed the lion. And then he ended up having to fight a bear, probably not by choice. I don't think he'd go out looking for bears and looking for lions. I think they may have found his sheep or found him, and he found himself in mortal combat. God delivered him from the lion. God delivered him from the bear. And then God delivered him from the giant. See, he just didn't take him from nothing to a giant. <laughs> he took him through a lion and then a bear and then a giant. It's called building your faith. So when he gets to the giant, he says, well, this giant's nothing but like that lion and that bear. It, I'll kill him because God will let me kill him. And that's when David goes out there and see the giant, <clears throat> Goliath, he's... He's sure of himself, you know. He, he, he's looking at this little kid, man, coming out against him. He's laughing. and He's cursing him in the name of his God, you know, and all this. And what he doesn't know is that David is an expert slingsman. I mean, he takes that sling and that rock, and he get, get about a rock about the size of a golf ball, and he gets that thing whoo, moving, whoo, and moving, whoo, and the centrifugal force of that thing, and he lets that thing go, and guess what Goliath doesn't have on? He's got all his armor on except one thing, his helmet. He plants it right there. Doesn't kill him, by the way. Doesn't, doesn't seem like it kills him. Knocks him out. David then takes his sword, best way he can, hacks off his head. That's how he kills him. Don't you know the Lord had to guide that rock? So what did he have? He had faith. But it was faith that God groomed, that God showed him over time how to, build, how to build that faith by trusting him with different circumstances. That's the same way you'll live. That's the same way you'll live your Christian life. God will take you through for different things. The thing to learn is, you say, well, I've failed so many times. I, I, so have I. But learn from them. Okay, Lord, I didn't trust you that. I should have. I didn't pray about that, but I should have. That's what you got to do. And if you'll do that, God will get you through. All right, let's all stand. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. If you come to the piano, we'll probably have just a few verses here of invitation.